Good afternoon, YouTubers. I'm in Scotland uh, doing a tour at the moment of all things Duff and Macduff. I thought I'd start at the beginning, and so I'm here at Macduff Castle in the Kingdom of Fife. It's situated just to the north of the Firth of Forth with Edinburgh away to the south. We Macduffs and Duffs were the dominant clan in the Kingdom of Fife, which is in the east of Scotland. Moncrief, the well-known antiquarian in his book, The Scottish Clans, in fact, the Highland Clans, which I have here, he says that the Macduffs were the preeminent clan in medieval Scotland. And as the preeminent clan, they had the right to crown the kings of Scotland. Also, in the Macduff Tartan, you'll see a blue stripe which uh, indicates the royal connection. If you look at the flag of Scotland, uh, the royal standard, that's not the blue and white saltire cross, uh, the royal standard is a lion rampant which is red on a yellow and gold background. And it's surrounded by uh, an ornamental red border. Now the only difference between that and the Macduff clan flag is that the Macduff flag does not have the red border. Uh, but that's an indication of the very early uh, closeness of the Macduff clan to the Scottish royal family. If we go further back in history to 500 AD, we know from the DNA record, the Y DNA record, that our ancestors were of Celtic origin. So they came over from the north of Ireland about 500 AD uh, to the new, newly established colony of Dunad, which is in Argyllshire. And over time, the Duffs and Macduffs migrated eastwards towards the Kingdom of Fife, uh, settling here about a thousand years ago. So now to Macduff Castle. The original castle was built by the Duff or Macduff Earls of Fife around 1057, before the Norman Conquest. It then passed to the Weems family, who are a sept of the clan Macduff, and was later in the hands of the Livingston clan. It was then passed to the Colvilles until 1651, when it was bought back again by Weems. It is a dramatic and extensive ruin. Uh, there are parts from the 14th, 16th and 17th centuries. The five-storey 16th century tower now remains, but there are extensive 17th century walls. The castle lies at the edge of the Firth of Forth and is in danger of falling into the sea. The castle sits above Weems Caves, which were formed by sea erosion about 8,000 years ago. The caves are ornamented with uh, mysterious Pictish wall drawings made long before the building of Macduff Castle. The castle is in a commanding position and looks out towards the Bass Rock and towards the city of Edinburgh in the far distance. As I said, it consists originally of five stories, but these have been considerably diminished. And in fact, in the last 50 years, it's uh, just a stump of its former self. I'm now standing right in the middle of the ruin, and you can see the remains of tower staircases, of turrets, now reclaimed by the local wildlife and vegetation. And you can see the magnificent vista out to the south.
And we'll take a look at uh, one of the old fireplaces that is over in the corner here. Still blackened from the many thousands of fires. And we'll take a peek in on one of the ruined ancient staircases. You can see the exterior wall has a severe crack running the full length from top to bottom. But the ruin still stands. And the castle dominates the tiny birch forest which stands just to the side of it. So I'm now inside the cave here, just below Macduff Castle. And over my shoulder you can possibly see one of the very earliest representations of a Viking longship. This was recorded, uh, I guess, around the 1200s, the period when the Vikings first appeared in this part of the land. And this is the view out of the cave here, Jonathan's Cave at Macduff's Castle. Good afternoon, YouTubers. Today, this afternoon, I'm sitting on top of the Cross of Macduff here near Newborough in Fife, at the northern end of the Kingdom of Fife. This is no ordinary location, no ordinary cross. According to the antiquarian, Robert Sibbald, it was put here in around 1059. That's uh, before the Norman conquest. And it was put here on the authority of the King of Scotland. The King of Scotland, at this location granted Macduff's immunity from prosecution if they had committed murder in hot blood. This immunity worked in the following manner. Uh, the Macduff had to come here to the cross of Macduff and he had to uh, come up to this plinth here that I'm sitting on and there's a small depression uh, or cup in which water collects and he had to bathe himself in the water and then he had to give up nine cows and a heifer in order to assuage himself of that guild. Now originally this uh, there was a full-size cross that was uh, taller than the height of two men uh, sitting on the top of this stone plinth but in uh, 1559 uh, during the Scottish Reformation, uh, a band of hot-headed uh, hot fellows under the uh, command of John Knox uh, destroyed, smashed to pieces the cross on the top uh, and scattered all the uh, shards of the, of the cross. So all that remains today is this stone plinth and a surrounding of stones. However, the Law, the legend of the law of Macduff and the immunity granted still carries on. We'll take a wee look at the plinth of the cross of Macduff in a bit more detail. There are a number of ancient holes here and if we look up on the top you'll see a little depression in which the water gathers and a number of other little cup marks. Some antiquarians believe that these cup marks actually date back to the Iron Age and that uh, they used an old stone, much older, that uh, Iron Age people had used for their ceremonies. The cross is located in a beautiful portion of Fifeshire farming land. We're actually technically in a place called Cooper, which is uh, one of the more rich agricultural areas. 
and as I walk around the cross of Macduff here you will see in a moment a vista of the Firth of Tay uh, which lies to the north of Fife and is the area uh, in which Perth is situated Perth being the area to which Macduff's uh, gradually drifted after about 1150. Uh, Macduff's, Macduff, the leader of the cat clan Macduff was granted land by the king uh, as a dowry when his son married the king's niece. So you see there to the north the Firth of Tay and of course Dundee lies on the Tay and further up um, Perth is also situated on the Tay. Towering above me now in rainy Abernethy is the Round Tower of Abernethy. This was built, uh, built for the abbots of Aber Abernethy and traditionally Macduff's were the abbots of Abernethy. And here we can see the full extent of the tower, all the way up to the top. There's a date on the clock, 1868, but that's only the date of restoration. Now here's another spot connected with Macduff history. This is Hunting Tower Castle. It was uh, belonged to William Ruthven who was a very important landowner in this area. He'd uh, owned land from as early as 1100, but he built the castle in the 1500s and it stands magnificently in this little corner of Perthshire. And his connection with Macduff was that uh, William Ruthven was accused of uh, a plot to assassinate James VI and uh, brought to trial in 1582 and with him uh, with him uh, John Baron Macduff was also tried and uh, both were found guilty of a plot to murder the king and so uh, both he and uh, Baron John Macduff were hanged in 1600. But Hunting Tower doesn't just have a connection with William Ruthven, it also has a connection with Charles Macduff. Uh, Charles Macduff was born in the late uh, 1700s in this area and he lived in the nearby bleach fields and he was the ancestor of a well-known Perth family, uh, a Perth family that live here to this very day, the Schoon Macduffs. At one point the well-known Perthshire family, the Murrays, also owned this castle and lived in it. So it's been connected intimately with Perth families through the years and today it's a National Trust for Scotland protected building. So now I'm up here on the roof of uh, Hunting Tower Castle. And behind me in the background you can see the fields of the surrounding countryside and also in the distance modern Perth. Good morning again YouTubers. Well I'm off on the Macduff Trail today again and uh, you may say it's folly and you would be right for here I am today at Macduff's Folly. Macduff's Folly is at Bonnard uh, in Schoon and Schoon is where the Traditionally, the kings of Scotland were crowned. And not only that, Schoon is also where a gentleman called Alexander Macduff uh, built himself a stately home. Alexander Macduff uh, 
from the Macduff family would have come way way back uh, from Fife but as I said yesterday uh, from about 1150 onwards the Macduffs made their way uh, to Perthshire and in fact uh, another separate lot uh, who branded themselves later as Duffs ended up in Banffshire and I'll say mo more about that later today. Anyway Alexander uh, Macduff was descended uh, from a family that uh, originally had been a little bit north of here in a valley called Strathbran. Now Strathbran was effectively Macduff Central. That was where all the Macduffs seemed to have congregated and uh, when I did research and looked into the different uh, dwellings in the Strathbran Valley every single one was occupied by a Duff or a Macduff in the uh, 1600s, 1700s and 1800s so it really was a, a significant uh, Macduff collecting place. Um, so yeah this Alexander Macduff who ultimately ended up here in uh, Bonnard he he was from the family that owned Findawi and Findawi was in Strathbran but they did so well that they moved to land south of uh, Findawi in Strathbran here in Bonnard and uh, over the years they developed that uh, land um, his father was Alexander Macduff and his mother was Margaret Ross uh, and by the time he was born uh, the family was very successful uh, they were so successful that um, during his lifetime in the mid uh, 1800s he built uh, a fairly large stately home called Bonnard House now Bonnard House uh, looks out on the hill that I'm standing on and um, either before the building of the house or sometime after um, this folly here was constructed for him to look out on. Um, follies were very popular uh, during the late 1700s uh, the period of the Scottish Enlightenment uh, when people like the idea of grand vistas and uh, interesting scenic points and if you had a folly at the edge of your property up on a hill uh, it was regarded as a very good thing. Various books um, cite the building of this folly as in the 17th, 18th or 19th century. It could have been any but um, perhaps I'll find out in more detail later. Anyway we'll take a closer look at the folly now. So we're looking down now on Bonnard House just hidden in the trees there and that schoon below it and as I pan round in the Tay Valley where the River Tay runs from Dunkeld uh, we'll see the city of Perth and as I pan round further see Macduff's Folly standing proud there on the edge of Alexander Macduff's property and now standing behind the folly you can see quite clearly that's that's exactly what it is it's just a facade looks like a tower but it's only a little arc of stones built up to look like a tower well now I've moved on to Trochery Castle. Trochery Castle here it is behind me. It's in the Strathbran Valley and it is an essential piece of Macduff history. Uh, Trochery Castle was uh, owned by William Ruthven. He was called Gowrie and he had a factor, uh, Baron John Macduff, who also lived here in the Strathbran Valley and uh, late in the 1500s James VI rode out from his residence at Falkland Palace which is an outlander location to visit Gowrie House where Ruthven and Macduff were located on that day. During the night uh, there were goings on 
that resulted in both William Ruthven and Baron John Macduff getting accused of trying to plot to murder the king. And eventually in 1600, uh, both William Ruthven and Baron John Macduff were tried and hanged. It's believed that they weren't actually guilty uh, and that it was politically convenient to get rid of the, both of them. Uh, in fact, 300 Perth citizens were interrogated in trying to prove their guilt. Uh, so there, there seems to be a concerted effort to, to neutralise these two figures. However, before John Macduff died, he he sired several sons and uh, one of them went on to be the ancestor of Alexander Macduff of Bonnard. Well, now I'm in Banffshire and behind me stands the splendid Balveni Castle. Balveni Castle, there was first a castle on this site in the 12th century. It's associated with the commons uh, and later on belonged to the Black Douglases and the Douglas clan in general. Ultimately, it uh, fell into the hands of the Duff family. And that Duff family is the very same family as uh, originally were Macduffs in Fife. But as I said before, there was one branch went north after about 1200 and ended up in Banshire. And they became a very powerful family, occupying perhaps as many as 40 different residencies uh, spread all over Banshire. Later on, we'll be going to see Duff House, which is the centerpiece of the Duff Banshire kingdom. But for just now, we're having a look at Balveni Castle. Uh, Balveni Castle is associated with whiskey inevitably because there's a, a whiskey brand that is distilled in Duff Town and that is called Balveni. And the Duff family are intimately associated with Duff Town and one of the Duff sons who was fighting in the Napoleonic Wars came back and built a row of cottages to house the soldiers from the Napoleonic wars, particularly pensioners. So this whole area is, uh, the fact that it's called Duff Town, just a mile down the road, indicates how strong the Duffs were in this area. Uh, the occupation of Duffs ended in uh, 1718 when William Duff, who was living here, committed suicide. And after that, the family moved down the road and they built a more modern house a Balveni house, which has now become part of the Duff Town distillery. So that's a potted history of Balveni Castle as it relates to uh, the Duff family. Well, here we are at last at Duff House in Banff. Duff House was built in 1740. 1740, a significant date uh, because it just uh, just before the run-up to the Battle of Culloden, Duff House was commissioned by uh, William Duff of Braco. He was also associated with uh, Balveni. He owned massive tracts of land uh, here in the northeast of of Scotland. The mansion was designed by William Adam, the very famous Enlightenment architect. It covers three stories and it's truly enormous. It was going to be built with two wings, but uh, the money ran out, uh, so it was never completed with the wings. But it's nevertheless uh, a very stunning piece of architecture. It's really the high point of the of the Duff's achievements in terms of um, dwelling places. William of Braco, William Duff of Braco and Alexander Duff, the father of the aforementioned Macduff of Bonhard, used to correspond fairly regularly and they addressed each other as cousins. So quite clearly there is a strong uh, familial link between the 
northeast duffs and the Perthshire duffs of Bonnard. The duffs left this house I think in about the 1930s. In the 1940s it was used as a hospital for wounded soldiers and also uh, I, th I believe prisoners of war. And in 1941 it was actually hit by one stray German bomb and there was a minor amount of damage done. But it was eventually acquired by the National Trust and is open to the public. Magnificent uh, building. Hidden behind me here in a, a very gloomy area of the woodland, about a mile from Duff House, is Duff House Mausoleum. William Duff of Braco decided that uh, being an Earl, uh, the Earl of Fife in fact, he wanted uh, to <clears throat> gather up all his Duff and Macduff ancestors, uh, so he had quite a few disinterred and uh, he then reinterred them in this mausoleum which he built around the same time as he built Duff House. This is the Carnelian Intaglio wax seal that originally belonged to the Right Honourable Arthur Duff, one of the younger sons of William Duff, uh, the man who built Duff House. This seal was created around 1763. I'll just demonstrate how the seal was used. So now you use the seal to make the impression. So now let's see the impression that it's made. So YouTubers, that concludes my two day sojourn visiting places associated with Duffs and McDuffs. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you've also learnt uh, some new things about Macduff history and I hope you'll get the chance maybe someday to visit these places. So it's goodbye from me and a shout out for Peter Macduff in California. Um, that item that I shot at Trochery, Trochery Castle, was very close to the place where Baron John Macduff hung the members of his family who were wayward. And also a shout out for Ivar Alexander Macduff in Sweden. <laughs>